who generously agreed to switch with Erica, but she's going to put it all together because she's actually going to talk to us about another disease and try to bring that together as to how that might help us um, solve the mystery of IPF. So she's going to be talking about lessons learned from hermansky prudlak syndrome. So Lisa is here at um, Vanderbilt, and so she didn't have to travel very far, and she's going to uh, talk to us about something else and wrap the whole wrap the whole thing up for us, right? Lisa. Definitely the wrap up. I promise. <laughs> These are my disclosures. All right. So hermansky pudlak syndrome is an autosomal recessive disorder. Uh, there are actually 10 known subtypes now, probably more to be discovered. It's most common in Puerto Rico due to a founder effect, but um, has been identified in patients worldwide. Now, the HPS proteins are ubiquitously expressed, and they're critical for endosomal trafficking and biogenesis of lysosome-related organelles in many different cell types. And so the clinical features of the disease are um, outside the lung are best understood in thinking about these lysosome-related organelles. So the albinism is shown here is due to, simply put, abnormal melanosome biogenesis. And the bleeding disorder that occurs in these patients is due to a lack of dense granules affecting platelet aggregation, even though their platelet numbers and other coagulation parameters are normal. The diagnosis can be made by platelet uh, whole mount EM, as shown here, looking for a reduced or absent dense granules, as well as increasingly by genetic testing. So I got interested in, in this disease in large part because the patterns of pulmonary fibrosis that had been reported in this were reported to resemble those that occur in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Of the 10 subtypes, however, pulmonary fibrosis only occurs in some of the subtypes, HPS 1, 2, and 4. Now, in these patients, um, the diagnosis is established typically by a chest CT scan. Um, some examples are shown here, and generally a UIP pattern has been reported, although um, I think there are often increased ground glass opacities as well. Lung biopsy is generally not needed if the clinical syndrome is recognized and is relatively contraindicated due to the bleeding risk, although I will say that many of these patients have successfully undergone lung transplantation, and the bleeding complications can be managed. Patients with HPS have been reported to have a progressive but variable rate in their decline in lung function. Um, there are patients um, living into their, into their 60s with HPS, um, but yet a severe onset in younger individuals. And when lung biopsies have been performed or histology has been looked at from lung um, explants, what's seen is usually a usual interstitial pattern of pulmonary fibrosis. So there have been two prior clinical trials in HPS pulmonary fibrosis. This was done with profenadone before it was trialed in IPF, both at the intramural program at the NIH, the NHGRI, led by uh, William Gall. And in these studies, profenadone was overall well tolerated with a profile similar to what's been reported in IPF trials. Um, however, these trials, the results of them were inconclusive or negative and really, in, in retrospect, clearly underpowered. And so a few things that have been learned, I think, from these trials is that um, these trials were difficult to enroll, um, and increased organization of the patient community is going to be needed to support future trials in this rare disease. Um, we need to have a better handle on the natural history of the disease um, to define, to better design trials. And then what I'll talk about in, um, later in the talk is thoughts about how hopefully we can get at a better understanding of pathogenesis to prioritize therapeutic targets. So. Before we get to pathogenesis, we think it's also important along the way to um, prepare for that day for those trials, and I've been fortunate to have an opportunity through the Rare Lung Diseases Consortium that's part of a Rare Diseases Clinical Research Network, um, which is an initiative of the Office of Rare Diseases Research, and NCATS, I'm supposed to say this. Um, but this, um, this grant opportunity is, is really helping us I think, prepare for treatment trials. This is the title of the study. It's a longitudinal observational study um, being conducted in similar ways to um, pre-symptomatic studies that are being done in other forms of pulmonary fibrosis. The sites are listed here, and I'm very grateful for these collaborations. Our target enrollment is 80 individuals, and we've enrolled 63 to date. And as you'll see, the median age of enrollment of 36 years is a reminder that this is a form of pulmonary fibrosis that is occurring at a younger age than is um, typically seen in, in um, some other forms of IPF. So um, as, we, as we 
work to prepare for trials, I want to mention that this is um, occurring in conjunction with efforts from the intramural program at NIH led by Bernadette Gochico and Bill Gall, as I mentioned, and also um, recent efforts from Jesse Roman to establish centers in Puerto Rico, though with setbacks from the recent hurricane, we think that this is going to be important components as we organize to move forward with trials. So now in the remainder of the talk, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how we've approached trying to understand pathogenesis of this disease with the hopes that um, this would inform what we bring forward therapeutically for HPS and also understanding of pulmonary fibrosis more broadly. So what we know from patients are that both the epithelial cells and, and macrophages are abnormal in the lungs of patients with HPS. Um, I mentioned the UIP patterns of fibrosis, but there are prominent hyperplastic alveolar epithelial cells, and also very interesting data that a macrophage alveolitis is present prior to the onset of pulmonary fibrosis. So just briefly, patients who have with HPS who have normal CT scans, normal pulmonary function tests, underwent bronchoscopy by Bernadette Gochico, and they had up to tenfold numbers of alveolar macrophages um, on BAL, and when put in culture, these macrophages elaborated a number of, of cytokines and chemokines, so that's where that data comes from. Now, there are numerous naturally occurring HPS mouse models all in the black six background, and in the unchallenged state, they have evidence of alveolar epithelial cell dysfunction and macrophage abnormalities as well. The single mutant models, however, while they do not develop spontaneous fibrosis, they have fibrotic susceptibility in many of the experimental fibrosis platforms. So we've taken advantage of these models to try to ask some questions about how these different cell types contribute to pulmonary fibrosis pathogenesis. And so because of the abnormalities in macrophages, and also because some of these patients get granulomatous colitis, for a while there was a lot of interest in whether um, macrophages might be the problem and whether bone marrow transplants might ever um, be a therapeutic option for patients. And so we tested this in mice, and in short, um, our data would, would suggest that that would not be the way to go, because when we transplanted wild-type marrow into HPS mice, we could not rescue the fibrotic susceptibility shown here by mortality um, or lung histology. And similarly, putting HPS mutant marrow into wild-type mice did not confer any problems. The converse experiments were to take advantage of one of the known um, trafficking defects and to correct one of the HPS mutations specifically in the lung epithelium using the human SPC promoter. So all of the other cell types, including macrophages, still have the abnormal HPS proteins, but when we corrected this in the epithelium, we significantly attenuated the fibrotic susceptibility of mice, indicating that, that the fibrosis was deriving primarily from the epithelium, not from the hematopoietic compartment in HPS mice, and this is the transgenic model that I'll refer back to in, um, in a few moments. So from there, we've gone on to try to understand what actually is going, um, going wrong in the epithelium, and there's been a lot of, uh, clearly ER stress plays a role in pulmonary fibrosis, and a number of other mechanisms of um, epithelial dysfunction have been studied, um, not just in our group, but by a number of other groups, and I don't have time to, to show you a lot of that negative data, but I do want to say that we don't see evidence of increased ER stress um, as a primary manifestation of the trafficking defect. We see our stress when fibrosis is present, but we don't see it just from the cells themselves. And so as we've worked through other mechanisms of epithelial cell dysfunction, um, one that, is, um, that has come to, to attention and to hold is that there's increased oxidative stress in these epithelial cells. So shown here are data from unchallenged epithelial cells from wild type and HPS mice with measures of lipid peroxidation, um, long F2 isoprostenes is a general ROS measure. And then the bottom panels, looking at um, in vivo imaging um, using IVIS um, over the chest of HPS mice. And so while there's increased ROS over the chest, it doesn't appear to be a generalized state of increased oxidative stress because there's no difference from other parts of the body. So there are many mechanisms of ROS generation. And, um, and we've, we've profiled them broadly, but one of them are the NADPH oxidases and, um, or the NOx enzymes that are, that are prominent uh, ROS generating uh, enzymes. And when we look at type 2 epithelial cells from HPS mice, we see increased expression of NOx4, but not other NADPH oxidases. 
And then looking in the lungs of unchallenged HPS mice, compared to wild type, we see increased staining in the type 2 alveolar epithelial cells. And when we look at the most normal areas that we can find of lung explants from HPS patients, we see increased NOx4 expression in the type 2 cells and also in fibroblasts, as would be expected and has been shown in IPF lung. So this led us to ask whether the no whether NOx4 was actually contributing to these mechanisms of oxidative stress. And so to test this, we took advantage of, um, of NOx4 flox mice that were generated by uh, Dr. Sadashima and crossed them with SPC Cree mice to delete NOx4 specifically in the epithelium and then back to the HPS background. And so when we delete NOx4 in the epithelial cells, we reduced measures of ROS in epithelial cells. Um, hydrogen peroxide production is the functional output of NOx4, and that's reduced, as is the measures of lipid um, peroxidation and alveolar epithelial cell apoptosis. So then we asked whether modifying the ROS, um, NOx4 mediated ROS in the epithelium, impacted fibrosis. And in short, it, it did, as shown here by lung histology, measures of lung collagen. Um, and, and fibrosis, as well as sort of other usual endpoints that I'm not showing you. So um, this led us to conclude that NOx4 in the lung epithelium is playing a role in contributing to excess ROS, as well as to epithelial cell apoptosis and fibrotic susceptibility. And to begin to understand um, why that might be, we also asked whether this was just um, a mechanism of ROS in general, um, or specific to NOx4. And so briefly here, we've um, modulated NOx1 and NOx2 mediated ROS through um, using P47 Fox knockout mice. And so when we crossed HPS mice with this model, we saw no attenuation in measures of fibrotic susceptibility, suggesting that it wasn't just ROS globally, although there are some limitations to this model as it's a global knockout. It suggested that there was something more specific to NOx4 mediated ROS. So this led us to ask why there would be increased ROS in epithelial cells and to start to address how this might be related to the underlying HPS trafficking defects. And so in collaboration um, with Susan Guttentag at Vanderbilt, we used CRISPR-Cas9 technology to, um, to delete HPS genes in the MLE15 mouse lung epithelial cell line. And in short, in doing this, we saw that some of the key measures of epithelial dysfunction that we've been seeing in primary cells were recapitulated in, um, in these CRISPR-Cas9 cell lines, including MCP1 production and the ROS measures, as I've shown here. And this data indicated to us that these were cell autonomous mechanisms, since these are just epithelial cells in culture, and that these likely did derive from the underlying trafficking defects. So we stepped back and taken a more ag agnostic view to what the mechanisms of uh, epithelial cell dys dysfunction might consist of, and I don't have time to show you all of this data, but um, one approach we've taken is to do RNA sequencing, and the pathways that are most enriched um, from these HPS cell lines um, are wound healing, hypoxia, which includes ROS, um, a variety of signaling pathways, as well as membrane raft, and then we go back to the primary epithelial cells and, and validate these pathways. And so I'm just going to take you through one part of this story next, which relates to TGF-beta signaling. Because when we did this, we saw that there's, there are measures of increased TGF-beta pathway activation in these unchallenged um, HPS epithelial cells. And so we asked what that, that might be, how that might be contributing. And what these data show is that TGF-beta signaling is contributing to this excess ROS. This has been shown in, in fibroblasts and other cell types. And so we can attenuate TGF-beta signaling either pharmacologically here and reduce ROS measures, or when we use a genetic approach, which, which um, utilizes deletion of the TGF-beta receptor 2, as was mentioned in a previous talk, um, specifically in epithelial cells. When we do that, that also attenuates all of these measures of NOx4-mediated ROS. And doing so by modulating the TGF-beta pathway and thereby reducing NOx4-mediated ROS kind of closes this part of the story because reducing this TGF-beta signaling protects the HPS epithelial cells from apoptosis and protects HPS mice from fibrosis, indicating a pathway by which TGF-beta signaling through excess NOx4-mediated ROS in the epithelial cells is driving fibrosis in epithelial cells, via epithelial cells. 
So, um, so we're we're taking advantage of these of these cell lines and different systems through mice to um, to further um, understand how. I'm very excited about how the endosomal pathways, specifically in these trafficking defects, are um, leading to these abnormal TGF beta signaling and the the other pathways that I've shown you. And that's work that's ongoing in our lab that I hope to tell you more about another time. But I wanted to um, to to kind of come out of the epithelial cell for a moment in the spirit of the other talks as well and tell you about some of the downstream targets and some of the ways that we that I think that um, that the dysfunctional epithelium is contributing through other cell types to contribute to fibrosis because I think this gives us some other ideas about therapeutic strategies as well. And one of them is, is macrophages. Um, so I told you before that macrophages weren't the cause of pulmonary fibrosis in HPS and really what I um, intend by that is that they're not the initiating cell type. But I think that we have some data that they're transducing epithelial defects and that's what I'll show you here. So these are some old data that, that kind of put us on this track where we found from HPS mice that it was really only the, the alveolar macrophages from the lung that had this activated phenotype and were um, hyper responsive to LPS as well as to TLR2 and 3 agonists. But macrophages from other compartments from HPS mice behave no differently than wild type. And this made sense when we looked at macrophages from the epithelial transgenic corrected model. So when we fixed the epithelium, we actually fixed the macrophage phenotypes. And when we did the bone marrow transplant experiments, despite putting wild type marrow in, the HPS mice still had abnormal macrophages, um, even when we waited six months to look at them. So this gave us a clue that the lung environment and the lung epithelium were regulating the macrophage phenotypes, but we really didn't know how um, as of these older publications. But recently we've profiled um, secretory uh, factors from epithelial cells and one that's clearly contributing to these macrophage phenotypes is uh, MCP1. And so the HPS uh, type 2 cells make excess MCP1 and this um, regulates the excess macrophage recruitment that occurs in the lungs of HPS mice. This is just um, general um, F480 positive macrophages that are shown here that are increased both in unchallenged mice and further upon bleomycin challenge. But I'll mention briefly that these are um, 11C low, 11B positive, GR1 negative, so sort of an interstitial macrophage population that are M2 skewed that comprise this increased cell type. And so when we use um, CCR2 knockout mice to, which is the receptor for MCP1, we're able to attenuate the fibrotic susceptibility as well as um, bleomycin-induced mortality in HPS mice. It doesn't com completely eliminate it, but it has a significant impact indicating that this is this MCP1 CCR2 axis is a key contributor in how the epithelium is, um, defect is transduced by macrophages in HPS mice. And so this led us to question what macrophages might actually be doing to contribute to fibrosis. And as been uh, mentioned by Erica and other speakers, there, there are many ways that uh, macrophages likely contribute. But just as a proof of concept, we deleted TGF beta 1 from um, myeloid cells using the lysum creep promoter. We also did this using um, bone marrow transplant with, um, with these mice as, as marrow donors as well. And so when we eliminate myeloid TGF beta, um, as shown here, this reduces the TGF beta in the alveolar space under homeostatic conditions and it protects HPS mice um, from bleomycin induced fibrosis. So although there are many cell types that produce TGF beta, this amount of TGF beta from this cell type in this compartment of the lung is an important contributor as a proof of concept. So. This is one way in which epithelial defects are transduced, but certainly um, fibroblasts are the primary matrix producing cells, and we've started to look at epithelial fibroblast interactions, and I just wanted to show a little bit of this very early data from our group. So these are um, fibroblasts at passage two cultured from the lungs of unchallenged HPS mice, and um, there's, there's increased gene expression of a number of pro-fibrotic and TGF-beta pathway-driven genes. And what's interesting is that in the epithelial 
transgenic corrected model, these are attenuated. So um, whether macrophages are also transducing this effect or it is simply dependent on the epithelium alone without other cell types, we don't know yet. But both fibroblast gene expression and also collagen production seem to be regulated by the epithelium. And um, this gives us some thoughts about other ways in which we might um, mediate this process. So in, in summary, um, HPS has provided a paradigm in which there are ubiquitously expressed trafficking defects in a systemic syndrome, but yet we've been able to um, use mouse models and other strategies to delineate that epithelial cell dysfunction is the primary driver of fibrosis. And because epithelial dysfunction is a unifying feature of many fibrotic lung diseases, my hope and belief is that further study of the trafficking defects in HPS will elucidate mechanisms of pulmonary fibrosis with broad relevance. So while we tease into the specifics of that genetic syndrome, we also think that, that defining some of the downstream mechanisms of how epithelial cell dysfunction is transduced may lead us to common ways to treat HPS pulmonary fibrosis as well as other types of pulmonary fibrosis. And in this disorder, um, the systemic syndrome is recognizable. Um, these young people are, are all at 100% risk for this disease, and we have an opportunity, um, and I think should be our absolute goal, to provide early disease treatment for this disease, as well as for other forms of pulmonary fibrosis. And so, if I may just comment, as has been discussed at this meeting, there are many different causes of pulmonary fibrosis, and I think it's been a very exciting meeting as we work to delineate um, some of the genetic mechanisms and move um, towards towards personalized or more precision medicine um, amidst this. But I would just add a, a word of caution that, that um, despite our excitement for leveraging um, those, those details to understand pathogenesis, when we wear a hat in the clinic, um, our treatment strategies often lag significantly behind um, that ability to split and provide that personalized care. And so until we, until we are able to determine which things that are different matter and which ones come back to common ground, um, I would just urge some caution. And, and, and with that, I think it's been great to have the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation bring us all together. And um, I thank you all for a great conference and for visiting Nashville. Uh, I'm fortunate to work with a great group here at Vanderbilt. and. Um, uh, thank you very much.